Hi, in this video, we're going to talk about network data and how it works in Android. And then I'll prepare you for a tutorial that's to follow. So there are three things that we're going to examine in this video. We're going to talk about what a REST API is. Then we're going to talk about how to program what's called asynchronous code. And then finally, we'll talk about the Volley library. So REST API is a term that you'll see in programming languages everywhere. It's really about clients and servers. The API stands for something called an application program interface. And really in plain English, it means that there's a server somewhere that's providing data to the client. So that way you have either phones, computers, or watches, or something out there that is relying on a service on the internet. In the following videos, we're going to create a tutorial in Android using a REST API from the service called metaweather.com. And so we're going to have a service that looks like this, where it provides you with a weekly forecast. And it will be up to us to design the user interface so that that data comes out and looks good. So a REST API is a service that lets you look at specific URLs, such as the address that you see listed here. And instead of responding with an HTML page, a web page, you get a back a, a pure data form. So it looks something like this here, where it says London City and an ID number. So REST APIs and microservices are two terms that often appear together. So sometimes a development team will break up an application into pieces, into micro pieces, you might say. And they use APIs to talk between those pieces. So a server can usually be split up into tasks. So this is a traditional model you might see. So we have at the bottom, we have a database, we have a data interface, we have a business logic, and then the user interface, a multi-tiered approach. Well, in microservices, you might say, well, that one data interface is actually could be split up into multiple pieces, and we'll call them microservices. Microservices can talk directly to the user interface, or they might provide data to other microservices. So that way you can have a modular approach to building your program. The link between those is the API. So the text messages that are traded between clients and servers are usually done in two different languages. One is JSON and the other is XML. There are others, but those are the two most common. So this is what JSON data looks like. You can see that this is a weather report and you can uh, also see that it is uh, very easily understood when you look at it. It tells you what the ID number is, the type of uh, weather that's for the day. You can see the minimum temperatures, the maximums. It's pretty much readable as a human would be able to uh, see it. But you can also see that there are uh, specific quotations and colons, and so it's a very data um, delimited piece of text. Now, the same data could have been created in an XML format. And so the XML format looks a little bit like uh, you just expect a web page. It's a hypertext. It's got these brackets and an open and enclosed tag. And so they're not exactly doing the exact same process. XML has a little bit more uh, functions to it. And uh, it's not as popular either. So most people are working on the left side here with JSON data in their APIs. So JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. And uh, it can be configured to send messages in not just JSON formats, APIs can be in others. But usually JSON is the type of data that you would expect to see. It's really common. And despite its name, JSON is not limited to JavaScript. So JSON can be used in many different programming languages. So if REST is associated with JSON, then the terminology SOAP is usually associated with XML. So SOAP stands for Simple Object Access Protocol. It, it's very similar to REST, but you can only see XML data when it comes to SOAP. So you could see JSON being used with REST and uh, XML being used with SOAP, but they're both per, pretty much produ producing the same uh, results here. They're both trying to communicate text messages to a client. So let's talk a minute about the client and the server. So the client's job is usually the one that says, I will initiate the request. I will ask for some data and the results will be sent back into the, uh, the format that the client can understand. So we're going to follow this video with a tutorial that will show you how to use the client for Android. So your client could be a, a phone, it could be a desktop, it could be a watch, it could be another server, but the uh, client and server is just kind of a generic way to think about it. So that we will use a phone here in our example, but in other cases we could just as easily have programmed this as a web page. 
So what does an API look like? So the REST service usually have some kind of an endpoint that provides access to the client. So in this example, we have a URL from the website metaweather.com API location and then a location number. And then what follows from that is the weather report for that specific ID number, which happens to be the city of London. And so in a traditional web page, you would at the green part of the stack of items, you would have said this is the web page. In a uh, REST service, we would say the URL endpoint is not a web page, it's just pure text. And then the client is responsible to format that text into the proper user interface. So how much work does it take to create a back end? Does it have to be written in Android? Does it have to be written in Java? What's the language? Well, the truth is it doesn't matter what the language is. And server applications can be written in PHP, C Sharp. They could be written in Java, Node. They could be written in Ruby, Python. Pretty much any language that can create text files and, co and communicate with a network is going to be eligible to make REST services. So the middle part here in the business logic can be any language that you choose. It's pretty much irrelevant. And so your team sometimes are split up as a back-end developer and a front-end developer. And that's thanks to the ability to create these APIs that can bridge the gap between the front and the back-end. Now, since there is such a nice standard with JSON, you can format the data to be output no matter what language that you're working with. And so we have no idea what metaweather.com used as their back end, whether it was Java, C Sharp, or something else. Now think about the amount of effort. So the UI, or the user interface in the front end, approximately takes about half of the amount of effort that it would take in the back end. Of course, that determines, that's determined by the complexity of your application. Sometimes the back end is really the secret sauce of an app, and that's what would take the majority of the time. But for the sake of time, we're going to use a pre-existing service, REST service. So if you're interested in learning how to create the back end, I have other tutorials, classes on PHP, classes on Java, classes on C Sharp, and all of those using their frameworks and their full stack will allow you to see how to create the uh, database and then the uh, URLs that are providing these services to you. But for the sake of it's going to follow here, we're going to create an Android application that is going to use a pre-existing free open source API. So we will only do half the work really for this weather app. Another feature that you're going to see in this application tutorial is that there is the idea of asynchronous code. Now in most examples of coding you're probably used to seeing synchronous code. That means one line follows the other. You can trace through exactly the order of statements in a, in a program. However, with callbacks or asynchronous code, we have an external process going on. And that's why in network programming here, the idea of asynchronous or callbacks is going to be super important. So let's take an example here. So I have some code in this gray box and its function says, get me some data. And it says, I want to go to a website, a URL, uh, an API, let's say, and I want to get some user data. So it looks like we're looking for user number 99. Now, that's going to take some time because of the network traffic, and it's kind of could be on the other side of the world. It might take a couple of seconds for that response to happen. And so we're not going to sit around and wait for it. We're going to jump right into the next item in the, in the program. So we're going to continue running. That's the synchronous mode. And we're going to just forget about our network request and let him catch up later. Now, that catch up later process is called the callback. And so when the process is done, there will be an alert sent to your application that says, hey, data's arrived. And what do you want to do with it? So the callback function will have a parameter, like a list or some kind of a string or something. And that will say, hey, I got the data back from the server. And now in this green, or in the, sorry, in this red processing box here, you can go ahead and process that, process that data. It means you can save it to the database or display it to the user or whatever your choice is. But the callback is going to uh, occur at some later time. And we're not sure if it's going to be a millisecond later or a minute later, but it will be a delay. So let's take a look at actually some of the code that we're going to develop here. So we are going to define a callback function and it will run after a set of data has successfully been retrieved from an online service. And so here's what it's going to look like. 
are going to have a button click for get weather by name. And uh, we are going to call this uh, service called the weather service. And it's going to get the forecast. So it's some function and it's an asynchronous function. So following that, we're going to have two options. So when this is done, we are going to have a on error. That's a possibility that nothing came back or it was badly formatted. Or we're going to have a response. And you can see in the response that I am updating an array adapter. So I'm showing a list on my UI. So this is the actual Java code that we're going to be coding in a tutorial in the next video. So this asynchronous process is going to help us with what's called non-blocking code. So non-blocking code is to allow other tasks in an application to continue running and not block up the uh, user interface. So you can see in the example in this timeline here that we in the first example would be a synchronous execution. So we stop all processing and wait for a response. However, in the second example below, you can see that we are going to start the external process, the network request, but then we're going to go on and do other things. We're going to keep processing the threads, you might say, and uh, we're going to have things going in parallel. And so it'll prevent the application from freezing up. So the first process will continue executing and then the other code will work in the background. In Android and in all applications, the user interface thread is important not to block. So we have a task list here. You can see I've got four applications running on my application. We don't want them to stop. There is a literal loop or a looper, they call it, an infinite loop, a while loop that continually checks on each task and gives each task a little bit of processing power. So it's the scheduler in the operating system. Now, if we were to stop one of those tasks and it had to sit and wait for a response, then your whole phone will freeze and it'll appear like your application is dead. You might get an application alert that says the process isn't responding. What do you want to do? Close the app? You might want to. And if the user does that, then you'll probably never come back to your app. They'll call it a buggy app and you don't want that to happen. So in, instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use this interface thread which is responsible to keep the uh, user interface running. We're not going to mess that up. Instead, we're going to offload this to a background task and we'll let that handle the uh, retrieval of network information. And that way the looper can continue to go on and the user can continue to choose menus and buttons and uh, just wait for the weather to get updated in the, uh, in the second app. Now to do all this network requests and all this looping and background processing, there are libraries that are built to handle these kind of things. So Android has several libraries available to us. There's one called Volley and another one called Retrofit. So Volley is the official documented library that you would find on the Android uh, tutorials. And that's the one we're going to use. It's been around for a long time. However, there's another one called Retrofit and it's actually probably more uh, feature fold. It might be a little bit easier to use and it's actually shown up recently in the uh, process called the Jetpack. So Jetpack is a, is a collection of libraries that are considered best practices by Google. And so even though we're not going to use Retrofit, it might be a better choice for future programming. But they, ver they work very similarly, so the concepts will be the same in either library. So here's what's ahead of us. We're going to create a weather application using an API and an Android. So we're going to install the Volley library, we're going to parse a JSON data feed, and then we're going to use asynchronous methods using callbacks to update our user interface. And so all of that stuff is just ahead of us. So let's take a look at how to build a weather app using Android.